How about now? We're good? All right. How are you guys this morning? I'm excited to be here. Not sick this time, this go around. Second opportunity to come back. Uh, I want to thank y'all for being here this morning. And to follow that song up, we're going to be talking about slavery. We're free, free, free indeed. And now I'm going to try to teach you how to be a good slave today. Um, <laughs> We're, we're going to, I hope, as I grow more in the Word and God gives me the comfortability to proclaim His message to others, I start to learn how that shapes. And for me, it's just diving right in. So I hope you guys will uh, just come with me in this little investigation we're going to do. And we're going to be hanging out in the Bible a good bit today. I would like to be in God's Word and just dive right into this message and hang out in there all day. Because ultimately, that's where all truth and everything about God comes from anyway, is His Word. So, my opening thoughts to give you on slavery is, you know, as Americans in, in the, the dark past we have on this, we have this stigma about it. It's hard to say the word slave. And especially in East Tennessee and being a white, big, plump Southerner on stage, you know, <laughs> it, without it just you know, having this, this ugly shadow over it. But what if I told you, what if I told you that slavery was kind of almost commissioned by God or like uh, that the disciples, the apostles were cool with calling themselves slaves. James, John, Peter, Jude, and Paul all referred to themselves as slaves. What if I told you that it's bringing ourselves to understand what what it means biblically in the sense of what it's saying in the Bible to understand, to help us be able to really love each other in a correct way, that this Word has a beauty to it. What would you say? What would you think about that? I mean, it's, it's kind of a hard and tough word, especially in our time where everybody's so politically correct, and you can say one little thing and it upset millions of people. But let's look at a verse right now. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For when you're, you, ah, for you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So you're a possession. When you claim Jesus, you're a possession of God. Let's look at another verse. Okay, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the Bible speaks on and on and on about this. You can find this in Titus and many different other references in the New Testament. There's over 40 times the word slave is used. We don't see slave that often in Bible because when it got retranslated into King James, it was changed to servant. The original word was doulos, or doulos is slave. And I'm from East Tennessee, so bear with me. I'm going to try to say this. Diakonos, it means deacon or servant. And there's two different distinct ways to view these words and how they function in the Bible. And today in our main passage, we're going to be reading to Matthew. We're in, if you got your device or, or your, your Bible, please turn with me. We're going to go right there and get right into it. We're going to uh, be reading from Matthew 20, and we're going to be starting on 17 to 28. I'll give you a second to get there. Now, this passage that we're going to read, most people start around 20 and then go to 28. And most people will tell you that there's greatness in serving through humility. Or you'll hear about a mother's love for her sons and how that's not bad. But I want to I wanna stress to you there's a deeper and just culturally shocking thing that Jesus is saying here. It's very scandalous, and, it's, and it even transcends to where we're at now. We're in a country that boasts that we are all free men and women, correct? And with that freedom, we have all these choices, and we can do this. And sometimes in Christianity, we think that we have free will to do certain things that really we, we shouldn't do. And we need to really examine ourselves and understand that we are bought, we are possession, and that there is a lordship. And what does all this mean to us and to each other? So 
Jesus is going to explain this to His disciples right now, but He uses this word servant and slave. And we're going to zero on in that and see what that means and how that relates to us. Okay, so at 17, it says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Okay, now what I want us to understand about this is this is a continual conversation. Everything that was just said is happening directly after what was just said. So Jesus made this statement, and this followed immediately after. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, with her sons kneeling down and asked something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I am about to be baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You indeed drink my cup and be baptized from the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on, the, and on my left hand is not mine to give. But if for those whom it is prepared by the Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with their two brothers. But Jesus called, or with the two brothers, but Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become your great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, or yeah, to serve and to give himself his life a ransom for many. So we got to get the gravity of what was just said here. This conversation, okay, this conversation is just extraordinary when you think about it in just practical conversations, just talking as though me and you were in a conversation. The Bible itself, when you start reading it, we read it in sections because that's the way it's laid out for us, verse by verse by verse. But it wasn't originally written like that. There were no verses. That's just an easy way to study it, and it was broke down for us that way. So I challenge you, when you read your Bible, try to read in one fluid text because we're going to go back a few chapters. We got, we got, to, we got to do a little pre-thought before we even build back up this conversation. So like, if you go back, let's say, in between 16 and leading up to this tra chapter and the other chapters, you're going to see that Jesus says several different things to the disciples. One of the things that He talks about is after the rich young ruler asked Jesus how could He be a disciple and He told him to give up all of His possessions and then come follow Me, and He couldn't. You know, Peter, he was like, we did that, what do we get? And He told him there are 12 thrones set for you. So in their minds, you got to think the disciples already knew there's 12 thrones set aside for us. There's 12 of us. Let's do the math. And there's, there's 12 thrones. We're going to get a throne. We're going to get to rule with the Messiah. How great is that? You know, upon other things that Jesus had said, how many times has He given the parables about masters and vineyards and servants? Several times He's talked to this notion to these men about this. And, and what makes it even crazier, in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, uh, I'm not going to read it all the way out, but if you want to read it on the, the board or whatever, this is the first time that Jesus predicts His death to His disciples. And He was met by Peter rebuking Him. Peter, that rebuke means a sharp criticism or a disapproval. He's like, you're the Messiah. They were looking for a political Messiah. They were looking for somebody to come back and put Rome in their place, to put everybody that was oppressing them in their place. They wanted a man with a sword and on a horse just going out and, and putting people underneath them and being the great nation. That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for a carpenter. They weren't looking for somebody that was going to be crucified. They were looking for a man of prominence because that's what, in, in their eyes as humans, they were looking for, a king. Okay? 
Um, so Peter's like, that's not going to happen to you. But, but Jesus rebukes him, even calls him Satan and tells him to get behind him. Because in the end verse, he, the end of it, he, he reveals what Peter's thoughts were. His intention in his heart of, of being disapproval to, to Jesus was, you know, he, he was thinking that, that why are you going to be put to death? You're the Messiah. You're gonna, you can put other people to death. We're going to reign over this world. And that's what the Jewish people were looking for. They were looking for a king like that to exert his power over people. Okay, the second time, what makes it so great? The second time is in Matthew 17, 22, 23, the second time he predicted his death. But before that, something amazing happened. And this is where this conversation is going to be so crazy and scandalous. There were three people that went with Jesus on the mount. It was James, it was Peter, and it was John. And something amazing happened. He transfigured in front of them. That means he went into his full glory. They got to see Jesus for who Jesus was. Okay, They heard the voice of God say, this is my son. There was no doubt left in their mind of who Jesus was. They were sold out. Okay, Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if you got to meet Jesus in his full glory? What he would look like? What it would do to you? To hear God's voice in an audible thundering way over you and proclaiming who it was? I, I can't even have the words of how I, or what I would do. They fell in their face. I mean, I probably would. I would just ah, all over the ground. It would, it would be like greatness. It would be insane. But I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to meeting him. Okay, so to make this conversation, we, we've had a little backlog here. To make this conversation what it is and to understand it fully, in conversation... Jesus took his disciples aside and was like, hey guys, we're going up to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem was a city on the hill. That's the way you had to travel up it. And he gave them the gospel in three sentences. What did he say? He said, the Son of Man himself, by the Jews, the, the Pharisees, you know, would be turned over to Rome and put to death on a cross. Okay, They would deliver him to the Gentiles, the Romans. They would mock him. What did they do to Jesus? They mocked him. They stripped him. They tied him over and beat him with the cat of nine tails until he was exposed and bloody. They fashioned a crown of thorns and put it on his head and mocked him as the king of Jews. Jesus is saying this is going to happen. This is what's going to happen. This is the heaviness of Jesus' words when he was speaking to his disciples. But then what happens next? You know, and that's not even the greatest thing. He said, I'll rise again. And that's all of our hope right there. But what happened next? John and James' mother, right after, right after they all heard Jesus say this, comes to Jesus and she's like, you know what? Won't you let my two sons sit on the right and left hand side of you in your kingdom as you set it up? Do y'all get that? Jesus just said, I'm going to die, guys. They're going to beat me to death. But I'm going to come back to life. I'm going to come back to life. And they were focused on their seating, where they were going to be at, who they were going to be in God's kingdom. The left and right hand side, the right hand being the second to the throne, the left being the third. This reveals where they were at in their heart at this time. They're still their, their thoughts about who Jesus was and what His kingdom would look like. You know, they, they've seen kingdoms. They've seen what kings do. They're thinking about the authority and the lordship that Jesus would put everybody under. And he just said, I'm going to die and rise again. And the only concern they had was where would they be sitting in those 12 thrones? That's pretty crazy, isn't it? We would think, oh man, that's horrible. I'm going to challenge you to think about yourselves here in a few minutes, as well as mine. Okay, but Jesus being who He is, loving, caring, He didn't rebuke them. He didn't, he didn't say awful words to Him. He didn't make them feel bad for what they said. He answered with the question. He said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? They still weren't getting it. He's like, I just told you I'm going to die. The cup, 
often referred to wrath and suffering. And the baptism was when he was in the river with John and the Spirit descended upon him. Okay? They had not received that yet. Remember, the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit come down on them. So these are still 12 men that have not experienced the Holy Spirit yet. And in their reason, in their earthly thinking, they're still thinking Jesus is going to be this, this great king and He's going to put all these people under us and we're going to get the rule beside of them in this land. And He's saying, you don't know what you're asking. But then He goes on to say, you will indeed drink My cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on My right hand and on My left hand is not Mine to give, but it is for those whom is prepared by My Father. So Jesus revealed a few things. He said, yeah, you're going to suffer. You're going to die for my sake. And they did. Out of the 12 disciples, 11 of them were martyred. They were crucified, stabbed, beaten, stoned to death. John was the only one that was left alive. And in some form and fashion, even that's bad because you got to think, what if you were the only person in your lifetime that shared a deepness with Jesus or the brotherhood that you were had that was the only one left to have those memories with? That would be torture in itself to be lonely and to be alone in that fashion. But they weren't alone. We'll find that out later. Um, But they indeed drunk from the same cup. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit. That is in every one of us. We're all baptized with the Holy Spirit. We have Him indwelling in us. It is not our body no longer. It's a temple that houses the Spirit. Each one of us in here that profess Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, let's look at the men, the other disciples. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. And see, these guys have been arguing. Okay, They've been walking along Jesus. They've been seeing miracles. They've been seeing all kinds of crazy things. People being healed. People being having demons cast out of them. Jesus walking on the water. I mean, that's insane. Walking on the water. I can float. I'm very buoyant. But I could never walk <laughs> on water. Okay, they saw this. They knew they all. Peter professed. He said, who am I? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. They got to see him transfigured. There Peter is. Listen, Peter was with James and John, saw Jesus transfigure. But it was James and John that had sent pretty much their mother up there to say, hey, ask Jesus this for us. Mark leaves out this part. This this is found also in Mark 10. Okay, but he doesn't make no mention of James' brother and John, because he's one of those other ten guys. It didn't matter. He was just stating what had happened. He was like, listen, these guys, these guys sent their mom up there. This is what Matthew's saying. <laughs> to ask Jesus to be great. Can you believe that? And Mark's version, he was just like, can you believe these guys? They're my brothers, and they wanted to be on the left and right-hand side of Jesus. Just leave us to the other ones. That was their mindset, okay? But Jesus who ministers to us through His Spirit and who's so loving and patient and passionate for us, shows that with how He responds to all 12 of them. He goes on to say, as He calls them to Himself, that's so important to understand that. He could have reacted any other way in that scenario, but He calmly called them to Himself and began to teach Him like He always did, so patiently. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who regret or have great exercise authority. Ah, let's say it again. Those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Let's think about what He said earlier. He said, My right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by the Father. Jesus was acting under servanthood to God. He said, Not my will, but your will be done. He asked God to pass the cup on, but He always ended, Not my will, your will, because he knew how great the suffering would be on the cross. But he still did what the Father asked him to do because he understood who was his Lord. Okay, when we profess Jesus to be our Lord, what are we really saying? 
Do we know the power that our words are saying? Are we taking that in great consideration? I want to talk to you for a minute, and this is going to get a little hard. It's hard for me to even think about this, about the twelve guys, the disciples. I mean, it's crazy that they would see all this stuff and hear all these wonderful things, but yet while they're traveling with Jesus, just be concerned on who's going to be placed where and what throne, and who's going to be the greatest disciple. You know, where is their place in Jesus' kingdom? And He just answered them to be a servant and a slave. But their minds are on greatness. And He just answered them, you're going to be a servant and a slave. So how does that translate to us now? I'm going to talk about three things. Self-centered, sin, and pride. Alright, those, those three things is what all the disciples had a problem with. They were obviously sinful because they had pride and self-centered because they were just concerned about where they were going to fit into the kingdom. Okay? Everything that they got from the Bible or from Jesus that was being taught to them, they were internalizing. They were keeping it for themselves. Right here. It's for me. It's for me. It's for me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. It's for me. Oh, that's wonderful. That's good news. It's for me. That's our problem. And we even translate that in our everyday life with our marriage, our family, um, material prob- or possessions, titles. I mean, what does that look like? So for your family, let's think about our family for a minute. Every one of us in this room, if we have somebody that we know that aren't with Jesus, pray and we, we hurt and we watch our family member go down the drain in the path of sin, and we're so tore up about it. And we pray and we pray and we pray, and we hope that God will do a great work in their life. And they're profession Christian. You know that they're also neglecting family. What family are they neglecting? The church. We're a family. Each and every one of you, that are out there are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I firmly believe that. I firmly can say to you that I love you and I'm here for you in any way that I can be with the the tools that God gives me. But too often, we put our own family before our church family. And this is where it gets a little hard to hear because I'm a father of two. I'm a husband. I've been a husband for 20 years. Uh, everything I do in my mind is evolved around serving my family. Okay? But if you serve your family so much that you neglect your church family and you church God in the way that you serve them, what are you doing? We're, we're going to look at this. We're going to build on this thought. Materials. What if you got a seven-bedroom house with four bathrooms, a two-car garage, a $65,000 truck, or, or a 16, or let's say a $1,000 beater and a trailer that has two bedrooms and a half bath in it, and you got to make the bathroom outside or something crazy like that. Let's, let's just, let's spectrum there. You got a spectrum of both ends, okay? What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? If you got the seven bedroom house and it's just two people living there and you've got six other bedrooms, what are those bedrooms doing? Collecting dust and furniture? Or is your home open? Is that bed open for anybody to come into it? What about your trailer? I only got like one bedroom. What can I do? You got a couch? Is your couch available to somebody? Can you host a small group? Maybe you got a small trailer in a large yard. What is it that you can do with it? What are we doing with our material possessions? Are they defining us? Or are we using them to glorify God? Okay, I'm, I'm going to build on this here in a minute. Titles. When we're thinking to ourselves about titles, I'm a supervisor. I'm a boss. I'm a father. I'm a brother. I'm a mother. So often, does brothers use their lordship to lord it over them? I never had a brother. I had two sisters. So, you know, I never had that dynamic, but by gosh, it drives me crazy to watch my oldest son and my youngest son because sometimes I can't differentiate which one's older and which one's younger by the way they act. I'm like, you know, 
sometimes the youngest one will have like great poise and walk in the room and just be like, I'm not going to let him bother me today. And I swear to you, he can walk by and my oldest one just give him a look. And it's like WWE Raw or something goes crazy. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, you can lord it over him that way. Or if you're a boss, you know, the title. You ever worked with somebody that griped about management and then they become a boss or got a little bit of power and they change. They, they themselves become the person they talked about. You know, these are the things that we think about. And this is what was going on with the disciples. They, in their mind, was thinking about the materials of being in Jesus' kingdom, their own family's plight. Salome, she wanted her sons to be at the very side of Jesus. It didn't matter about the other ten. She was concerned about her family, the materials and the titles. What can we do with this title? Are we going to be great? Who's going to be the greatest out of us? Okay, that's our mindset sometimes when we're not focused on what Jesus was saying. In, in, in ultimate humility, think about it, ultimate humility, Jesus was stripped naked and beat, hung on a cross for all to see. Why did He do it? Why did He leave heaven? It was out of love. God created us. He wants to own us. He wants to possess us. Because He loves us. He loves us. And one of the greatest things that I've learned about God is you don't got to do anything to get to Him. He's always behind you, tapping you on the shoulder. Just turn around. Just turn around. I'm right here. And I love you. And He accepts you for who you are. And He changes you and transforms you. But it's through this thought of what Jesus says. It shall not be so among you. Because think about it. We look at all the rulers of the world and they use their power to, a, to use it to just lord it over people. This is, this is me. I'm, I'm your dictator. I'm going to tell you to live this country this way. There's no Christianity that can be allowed in it. Or even in our society, we have people that's a divided party. We get so caught up in who's Democrat, who's Republican. We put these titles over our names and we forget we're people and we argue over stuff that's going to go away anyway. We're not being eternal minded. We're just worried about stuff here that affect us and not about each other, how it affects each other. If it affects me this way, I want to change it. I really don't care how it affects you, but it's affecting me this way, so it's got to be changed. That's the way that we look, and that's the way we use our power here on earth is to hurt each other. But Jesus says that's not the way it's going to be in my kingdom. He said in my kingdom, you're going to be a servant. You're going to be a slave. So what does that look like? What does that look like for us to be a servant and a slave? We got this thing going on now in, in churches everywhere. Like, there's not too many... You know, I'm going to use this loosely. I don't really like using this term that much, but unchurched people coming in and out of the door. We see a lot of new people coming from different churches. Why is that? It's because they're looking for love. They're looking for something. They're looking for that John 15. You know, in John 15, he said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples by the way that you... Love one another. And the way that we love one another is how we serve one another. Like, do you think that you come here every Sunday just to sit in that chair and be a storehouse of grace and mercy? No. We're called to do something way beyond that, way beyond ourselves. We're called to be instruments of grace and mercy. Conductors of grace and mercy. We're called to give it to other people. To love each other. Not just whenever they're perfect. Not just whenever everything's right in their life. But at the worst moment, love them regardless of where they're at in life. Because that kind of love transforms them. That kind of love is what we all heard and it changed us. So why should we keep that inside of us? We should give that to others. And the way, the way that we get there is understanding where we fit in the kingdom of God. And how great it is to be a slave to God. To say, I'm in full authority of you. And Christ is our greatest example of this. I'm going to walk you through something that, that stood out in me in the Bible. And I want to try to paint this with the best human ability that I can. Because I'm not a great theologian. I'm not somebody that has went to any kind of Bible college. But when I read this and the dots started connecting, it painted this picture in my mind that blessed my heart. 
And I can only hope that I can use the words to give this to you guys. So in Exodus 21, I'm going to roll on over there. We're going to start in Exodus 21. There's something funny going on here. We've got to understand what's going on here. There are laws being made about servanthood. You get that? The notion that you can sell yourself as a, as a servant to somebody, whether it be debt or that you owe somebody something, but under that law, you can only do it for six years. Okay? So the seventh year would come up, you could go free. But you could literally sell yourself as a servant to somebody else. But you couldn't stay eternally. They couldn't force you. They couldn't oppress you to be a slave. So this is concerning that. In Exodus, it says, Now these things are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, he shall, or, and she has borne his sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go free, then the master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, and on the doorpost of the master, or, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So let's think about what that just said. It's saying that if you go into servanthood with a wife, and your time, your seven years comes up, you can leave with that wife. That was yours going into it. But if for some reason you go in by yourself, and your master gives you a wife, and you have children, and your seven years come up, you have to leave empty-handed. You can go free, but you have to leave your wife and children because they are still property of the Master because He gave that to you. Okay? In order to stay with them, you have to become a slave. You're no longer a servant. So that you would go to the judges, the doorpost, get your ear laid on the doorpost and all put through it, symbolizing that you belong to that Master forever. Simple enough thought. That's a rule. Let's, let's roll on over. Let's look deeper to another dot connected by this. Because this is a really wonderful picture of who Jesus is and who we are to Jesus. Let's go to Psalms 40. And we're going to be in verse 6. God's probably beat me there on the screen. It's okay. I'll take my time. You processing, processing like, well, this dude's being heavy today. I usually teach children's ministry, so. <laughs> All right. So on verse six, it says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Now, a lot of people, when you read that, I, especially when I first read it, open, like I'm thinking hearing, has nothing to do with hearing. Hearing. If you understand what the Jews are talking about in their language, when they say, you have opened my ears, you will understand they were talking about that moment in servanthood. They referred to it as opening the ears, as putting that all in it. And burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to your, your will, O oh my God, and your law is written in me. This is David's psalm. And it's a messianic prophecy that, that is foretelling Jesus. But he says, you have opened my ear. You didn't, you didn't want to burn offering and a sin offering. You didn't want to have to do that. God doesn't want to have to punish sin. He doesn't want that for anybody. But he, he sent Jesus and Jesus' ear was open. What, did, what was it open for? Well, we're going to go on over to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews 10, 5, 9. 
Do, 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 do. Hebrews 10, 5, 9. I love God's Word. I love being in it. It's just wonderful. 5, 9. 5, 9. Okay, here we go. I'm apparently going to need glasses, too. Okay. All right, right here. So he, he's saying this over again. The writer of Hebrews is echoing this from Psalms. Therefore, he came into the world. He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. And I said, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Did you get that? It changed. So you opened my ear. So to open the ear, what had to take place? Had to be pierced, right? A hole had to be placed in it. Jesus is saying, now you prepared a body for it to be pierced. And why is he being pierced? What was the original idea in Exodus? Under the lordship of a master, if you get a, a wife and you have children, in order for you to keep those eternally, you had to come before the judge and have your ear open, all pierced, to say that you are eternally that master's slave. Who are we? Who are we? We are the bride of Christ. We are the church. Are we not? Are we not referred to as the bride? That is a great thing, is it not? And what did our groom do? Under his servanthood to God, what did he do? He gave us, His church, to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He went before Him and had His body pierced for us. For eternity. Because why? He loved us. If you love your wife, if you love your children, and you go before your Master, He takes you to the judges and pierces your ear. He went before God and took every bit of the wrath for us. So what do we do with that knowledge of that? That beautiful picture that's painted throughout the Bible of who Jesus is. He was the ultimate servant who did the ultimate sacrifice for the people He loved. And that's who He's called us to be. We can't be storehouses. We can't come here and just sit in a chair every week and think that's good enough for God. You already have salvation, but how is people's lives changed or transformed without each other? He chooses to use each of you in these chairs to fulfill something in someone else's life. Do you really want to block that or do you want to be a blessing to somebody? Do you want to go out of your way and love people? And sometimes it requires us to make sacrifices. It requires us to get dirty alongside of them. Sometimes it causes us pain because we're betrayed by the people we're trying to hurt. But it's transformating. It, it changes them. The suffering that we endure, the cup that we're drinking by the the prompting of the Holy Spirit working through us to touch that other person changes them. Who doesn't want to be a part of that? And think about each other. Look, at, look around. Look at each other. These are your brothers and sisters. This is each other. When you are in this room, you are serving one another. You are loving one another. How can we do that on an ongoing basis? What, what, what service? For me, that's children's ministry. For Shane, it's playing up here in the drums. I don't know how it's fashioned for you. It's how God's gifted you with whatever spirit He's given you to be gifted by. Some of us are teachers. Some of us will be, do, do really good at greeting. They can walk right up to a, a tree and be like, hey, how are you doing? Jesus loves you. You know what I mean? They just have that ability, that charisma to be able to do that. But why keep it to yourself is all that I'm challenging you. Why not use it with one another and serve one another? This life... If you live this life and you never serve one another, you're always going to be a consumer because you're always trying to take in to fill something that's missing. And what's missing? You were made for a purpose. And your purpose was to serve one another, to bring glory to God by it. When you suffer for the sake of others, you're bringing God glory. When you're saying, I submit myself to you, do you know what you're saying? You're saying, I'm giving my whole life everything that I own and have achieved in this life, my house, my cars, all the material possessions and the wealth that I have, my family, I am a servant to you. I'm a steward of these things because you provided them for me. What am I doing with them to glorify you? 
Then you got to start outwardly focusing on other people. How can I love on you today? Or how can I love on you guys? And be involved with one another. We can't come in and just sit arm to arm every day. We got to be involved with each other. And, and here, the way that we choose to do it here is small groups. That's a good step if you've never been a part of a small group and you're not in a small group. Get involved in a small group. It's an ongoing conversation of what's going on here and your faith and your walk in Christ with each other. We should be able to have a safe place to go and, and tell people what's going on. You know, too often life is ugly and nobody wants to share nothing because pride. Remember, we're talking about pride. You know, we need humility. It's hard to walk up to somebody and say, I have a problem with money. I spend money. That's me. My wife's a saver. I'm a spender. If I got 20 bucks in my pocket, I got a dime probably tomorrow. So, like, you know, that, that's me. I have a problem with that. And I'm going to be open with it. Some people's pornography. That's a little bit more dirtier. Can anybody say they feel comfortable saying they have that problem in a group of people? And why not? That speaks so poorly of the group of people that they're around that they can't admit something to be free from it. You understand, we don't live in a life of bondage. We were set free. We were set free from sin. And we were set free by Jesus through sin and the ability to be honest with none, one another, to be honest and say, I have an issue with this in my life. Can you pray with me over it or hold me accountable? Accountability is a beautiful word. You know what's not a beautiful word? Preference. Preference in ministry is not a beautiful word. All right? Like... Showing somebody preference because of the clothes they wear or the status they have in your community. There's nothing beautiful about it. To say, I'm going to give more of my time to this person because they look like their life is together and it's more convenient to serve them and not going after the people that have all this going on in their life. They're here in that chair for a reason. God appointed that reason that day for them to be there. It's up to us now to love on them. Okay, we can't save anybody. God does that himself when he draws them to himself. But we are conductors of his love to each other. The way that we love each other, that's what makes people stick around. Is they're like, did you hear what that person said in small group? One thing that I, I really think about is my brother-in-law, Jeff Brigman. If you look on his arms and see his tattoos, his story is blatant. I mean, if you understand anything about tattoos, you could see where he's been in his walk of life. And his interpretation of true life was based on things that he has been through from previous churches. One of the things he said to my sister before he come here was, I'm going to roll my sleeves up and they're going to look at me and that'll let me know all that I need to know. And when he come in and nobody gave him a second glance and they were like, hey, how you doing? You want to come to small group? He, he was shocked by it. There was no judgment. I heard a woman stand up in here before and say, my God was a straw and a pill. This was in my early walk with this family. And I was like, okay, here we go. We're going to see some talking, some, some chattering. No. There were hands up. There were people shouting, encouraging her to speak on love. I've heard many stories like this over and over and over again, and it's changed me profoundly the way that I view all of you and the people that are out there. It has encouraged me to seek after that lost sheep more, to put myself into positions to where I can find them. Because that's, that's how we fail sometimes as Christians too. We don't put ourselves into position to find a lost sheep. We would rather stay under the steeple, hiding from broken people. You know what I mean? It's one of my favorite verses in the song. We hide under roof and steeple, afraid of broken people. What does that mean? We, we'd rather be here around each other as to go out into the slummier part of town and, and try to talk a conversation with somebody that's lost. And we shouldn't generate that on our own. It all comes from the authority from Jesus. We should be inspired to do that. We should be passionate to do that. We should want to do that. If you don't have that passion, if you don't have that inspiration to do so, I inspire you to hang out in John a little bit. Read Jesus. Read His words. Read His teachings. Really focus in on Him. Let Him weigh heavy His words on your life and then see how it transforms you. The way that you treat other people. The real idea of how to be a good slave isn't so much slavery. It's being humble to one another. 
focusing on one another. Understanding that this life isn't about what we accumulate to ourselves or what we do ourselves or where we fit into the picture, but it's fitting other people into the fit picture. There's going to be a day and a time the great white throne judgment comes upon us. And, and Jesus judges the world for what it is. It isn't to scare the lost people. When this is written, I've come to the full conclusion that it's to motivate the saved people to go after the lost people. That He's given you the foreknowledge of what's going to go down, how it's going to go down. you got limited time. What are you doing with it? So my encouragement to you today is look at Jesus as the example. Look at what He did for us. How beautiful of a picture that was in God's Word that we're His bride. Under the servanthood of God, He took us and wanted full ownership of us for all eternity that He pierced Himself for us and He loved us exactly where we were at. I mean, most of you know my, my testimony. Love is something that's really hard for me to talk about. I mean, like when you sell drugs, you really hate other people. I mean, there's no, you're, it's all about money. It's all about material things. It's all about what I'm getting from other people. You're 100% consumer. You're consuming everything that you can get out of somebody and almost being a vampire by sucking the very essence out of them. Who am I to God that He would even let me be on this stage and talk to you about being a servant now? You know, those thoughts the enemy uses in my mind sometimes. And then I remember, oh, I remember He did it for me. He loved me. He wants me to be here. If I wasn't here talking about this right now, there would be somebody out there that needed to hear it. Who would be in my shoes? Why would I want to miss out on being a blessing to somebody? Because everybody that's ministered to me to this point in my life has been blessings to me and been bringing God glory and been showing me how to do it to others. You know, it's others. When I look in the Bible, I see exactly what God's doing in me and with me, and it turns my eyes back out to focus on you all. Because I love you. I love you the way that Jesus loves you. I love you, and I want to show you that love. I want you to show each other that love. I want to challenge you. If you come to church and you just come, or I even hate saying that, don't come to church. Come to this building and be the church. Come and be the church with one another. Hold each other's hands. Let's worship. Let's be in each other's lives. Let people be in your life. That's one of the most hardest things to do is let people in. Because you don't want to show everybody you're ugly. Who wants to see you're ugly? I do. <laughs> I'll show you my crazy. I mean, you don't know. They, they've unlocked me from downstairs. I come from the pit of children. So <laughs> things can get weird sometimes. You know what I mean? But regardless, I want to see it. Can you say that for yourself? I want to see somebody's weirdness or they're ugly. I'm going to love them exactly where they're at because that's what was done for me. When we start doing that together, that's when you change a culture and a community and everything else around it. We can't change the world. We all know where the world's going. The Bible is very explicit about this. But we can change the environment and affect it around us with Christ by the way that we simply serve one another and we love one another. Okay. I'm going to end in prayer, and before I do, I want to talk about a couple things. In your form, you have a service opportunity. You know, uh, if you don't know where to serve, a few good ways to find that out is just try. Just try something out. See, see how it fits you. See if, if you're passionate about it. You know, we have a spiritual maturity class. We have... A, uh, spiritual gift class. We have an evangelism class. These things are on Wednesday nights ever so often. If you hear one come up, get plugged into it. See where you fall in those things. They're good indicators. You know, the, the inventory that you do in spiritual gifts isn't going to tell you 100% this is you, but it's going to give you a good idea of where God's pointing you. And too often, what we want to think is... My last spiritual gift class, there was a lady that come in there and she looked at her inventory and she looked at me a few times. And she was like, this isn't right. And I was like, why is that not right? And she's like, because I'm an introvert. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah? It's like, what's it saying? She's like, evangelism. I was like, 
<laughs> All right, that's the glory of God right there because He's going to call you out of your comfort zone to do something. And she just kept shaking her head. And she had this, this doubt. Three Sundays ago, I'm walking through the hallway getting ready for my, my deal downstairs in the pit. And guess who I see by the door? That same lady handing out flyers and greeting people. And I was like, oh my gosh, she was obedient. And it just pumped me up. I had to go hug her. I was like, ah! Because she's doing what God has called her to do out of her comfort zone. And so often that's what He does. So, we have service opportunities. If you feel like you want to get plugged in one of these, the children's ministry, to try, try it out. Baptism team. we got sound. we got worship. If you can play drums. We, we need a drummer. We need all kinds of musicians. Anything. Tambourine would be cool, would it not? I don't know. Shane's like, hold up. All right. Small groups. Anything like that. Celebrate recovery. I think like celebrate recovery is overlooked a little bit because it, it's got a stigma about it. Like people think it's just a drug oriented program, but no, it's for hurts, habits, and hangups, which we all have. It's a safe place to go to talk about things that's going on in your life. So, you know, that, that's something you can check out. And then the children's ministry. If you'll take those out and fill them out, we're going to have some guys come up the baskets and, and you can place them in or leave them in the altar. Or, not altar, listen to me. The, uh, the box is back there. Um, there's no pressure, but I just want to strongly tell you that your conductors, if you've never thought about serving others before, try something out and see what God's got in store for you. Be used and be a blessing to somebody. Another thing that's coming up is on Wednesday, November the 28th, we got uh, some dinner provided and we're going to be apparently putting up Christmas decorations around the church. Like, how can that be an opportunity of service? Well, you're putting up Christmas decorations, which I'm not the greatest at because I can barely dress myself. My wife has to help me. I run in three times like, hey, does this match? Not that way. What do you mean? I, originally, I had this untucked with two buttons, and she was like, either all the way or no way. And I'm like, okay, so I'll tuck it in. You know, so that's a way to you can come and just get to know one another. These opportunities could be looked at as, I don't know nobody here, but I want to be a part of this family. I want to be plugged in. I want to get to know people. Use these as opportunities to get to know one another in fellowship. So that's coming up on the 28th, and there will be food provided. And you know food is great. So, I mean, and there's some people that can cook around here. I can testify on that. So come to it. I want to end real quick on Philippians 2, 7, 11. Okay. Chapter 2, 7 verses, or verse 7 through 11. It said, But God, but made Himself of no reputation, no reputation. He made himself a no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant, which is translated slave, and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Lordship. Even to the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God the Father. And that's what happens when we can understand what we say about, I give you my life, God. You're, you're actively giving Him ownership in your life. It brings Him glory by the way that you love one another and serve one another. Thank you for hanging out with me and listening because I know some of this was tough. It's hard to hear about some of these things. Uh, I'm going to close this in prayer and you guys have a great day, okay? Dear Lord, I just thank You for this day that You created and I thank You for this opportunity that I get to proclaim Your Word, Lord. And I, I pray that we move in our hearts and we, we stir that we... Look for opportunities to love on one another, to hold each other accountable, to serve one another, to feel safe enough to let each other in all of our lives to show each other our good and our bad sides, Lord, to, to help us 
go after the lost, no matter where they're at, knowing that you empowered us and called us to do so. Lord, help us be humble and complete humility to you, knowing that you are our full owner, the provider of all things, Lord, that you give us everything that we have through Jesus and through the the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that you meet all of our needs and that you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Y'all have a great day, okay?